I'm happy to introduce the speakers for today, Anu Gopalakrishnan and Beth Kautz. They're talking about uh, a project that they did to teach communication strategies in a German class on an ongoing basis. And they're talking about the way in which this, this project of instruction affected the learner's communicative resilience, willingness to use German. So I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Elaine, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you in your interest in our presentation. So, developing communicative resilience in language learners. Real life interactions in communication pose a unique set of challenges to language learners. And to help language learners overcome these challenges and struggles has been the focus of researchers and practitioners for a long time now. In everyday interactions, we engage in real-time processing, and because this does not give us a lot of time to think, we often encounter difficulties or breakdowns in communication. And I'm not even talking here about external disturbances or interferences, but those struggles that can be attributed directly to the linguistic capabilities of the speaker. In such situations, we then use alternate ways or methods of communication and these alternate ways, both verbal and nonverbal, are called communication strategies. Now, that is a very, very simplified definition of communication strategies. In all the, in all the research that has focused on strategies, several definitions have been put forth. Diorne and Scott compiled and compared all these definitions and identified three important features that occur over or across all these definitions. <coughs> the first is of problem solving. When there is a mismatch between the linguistic resources or the interlanguage of the user of, or of the language learner and his or her communicative intentions, that is when the person encounters communication breakdowns. And in such cases, he draws on communication strategies as linguistic devices that help him or her overcome this problem. Hence, the feature of problem solving. The second is consciousness. Now, the strategy a user, um, a user uses depends not just on his individual preferences or capabilities, but also on whether the listener is able to understand what he's trying to say. So now I might use gestures to explain something to you, but if you're not able to understand that, I need to possess the metacognitive skill to choose immediately a different strategy so that you understand what I'm trying to say. Hence, consciousness. And the last is communication enhancement. Now, Canal takes the definition of strategy use a step further and says it doesn't, it does, it doesn't stop with problem solving, but it actually enhances the quality of communication because the speaker draws from a wider range of vocabulary and a variety of linguistic elements and structures. Hence, these three uh, features were, identifies, were, were identified as the most common among all the definitions on communication strategies. Now, to explain, uh, to help you understand what communication strategies are, why and when we use them. I have a little activity here um, that calls for a little audience participation. So let's assume you want to describe this shape to your partner. Okay? And for the sake of this activity, let's assume that you don't know or forgot the word for this shape. There is a very specific word for this shape. How would you communicate it? Uh-huh, a rounded square, okay. It's, like, it's like a square. It's like a square. It's like a circle. Interesting, because the word for it actually is squirkle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really is a word, <laughs> because it's a combination of a square and a circle. But as you can see, we come across such unknown words or uh, sometimes we don't know how to express a thought or idea very often in our everyday interactions. And this is why communication strategies are an integral part of our everyday communication. 
and it is all the more important that we train second language learners to be competent in the use of these strategies given their limited linguistic resources. Kenal and Swain identified the significance of strategic competence long ago in their groundbreaking paper on communicative competence. They defined it as verbal, um, the use of verbal and nonverbal communication strategies that may be called into action to compensate for breakdowns in communication. In other words, they described communication strategies as these verbal and nonverbal codes that we might use or these linguistic devices that we might use to transmit information effectively and successively even with limited linguistic resources. Now, in all the research um, over the last four or five decades on communication strategies, there have been two parallel views. Now, the first group of researchers looked at the linguistic production of language learners as they studied communication strategies. The second group, um, on the contrary, looked at the psychological and cognitive processing that goes behind the use of these strategies. Now the first group, because they looked at the linguistic production, they studied the use of strategies in, in, the, in the external interactive performance among speakers. And their second group looked at the internal competence or the cognitive processing, as I said earlier, that goes behind this use. The first group believed, uh, as the, because they studied the linguistic production, and as they did that, they realized communication strategies can be taught, while the second group believed because it's a cognitive process, it is transferred automatically from the first language into the second language, and we don't need to use this. Uh, we don't need to teach them these strategies. Now, our study falls under the first group of researchers. We follow that line of thought in saying, we do, in saying that um, not only can like, communication strategies be taught, but there is also a lot of value in teaching language learners these strategies and, and learners benefit greatly from it. And we will see more of this later as we share the data. Okay, so um, let's, uh, um, let's see what happens when communication breakdowns occur. So let's assume that this line represents the smooth flow of communication between two speakers. And then suddenly, there is an interruption or a disturbance in the communication that, that hinders it. And this is what Journey calls impasse or communication breakdown. Now, this can occur due to several reasons. Like in the example of squircle, the speaker might not know the word, or the speaker might forget how to say something, or the listener might not understand what the speaker is trying to say and might interrupt him or her and say, explain that better to me. Now, it is up to the listener and the speaker together to resume the flow of communication. To do that, the speaker requires two things. First, the speaker needs to know of alternate ways or methods to communicate the unknown word. Second, he needs to possess the linguistic resources to be able to do that. Now, it is the combination of these two, so the knowledge of alternate ways and the supporting linguistic resources that we call communicative resilience. So communicative resilience can be defined as this linguistic ability in a speaker to overcome, com to overcome interruptions or breakdowns in an interaction and to ensure the flow of com that the flow of communication is restored. Now, comparing communicative resilience to strategic competence put forth by Canal and Swain, one could say that communicative resilience is a result of strategic competence. So if a language learner is competent at drawing on communication strategies whenever necessary, then he or she can make sure that communication flows smoothly even in the face of interruptions. So one could say that Strategic competence is the internal competence in a speaker and communicative resilience is the external performance that happens as a result of being strategically competent. Now this was all in theory and this is what we wanted to explore further in our study. We wanted to see if we explicitly taught students communication strategies, would that lead them to being more communicatively resilient? So the question we tried to answer was, 
to what extent does continuous and explicit instruction of communication strategies lead to communicative resilience in second language learners? And to do that, we sought the help of Dr. Kautz. Okay, so um, late last spring, earlier in the summer, Anu came to me and we had collaborated once before on a class project that Anu was doing. And she came with all these great ideas that she just presented to you and asked if she could work um, with my students to test this out. And I'm always game. And so, um, so this was a very collaborative project. Um, so Anu brought the research, the, the idea of, of how to structure the study. I brought the knowledge of my students, what I thought they could do, the way it could kind of work during my 50 minute class period throughout the semester. And Elaine brought the expertise to help us tweak things and what kind of data did we need to elicit and how to structure the exercises to get that. And so uh, last semester we met every Friday morning for about a half hour, 45 minutes in my office, the three of us, and debriefed what had happened on the previous Monday and planned for the following Monday. And so what we worked on then was um, continuous strategy instruction, 15 minutes a week. And so the way this worked was I scheduled in my syllabus um, that every Monday at 8.30, 8.35, Anu would walk into my classroom and she would have the last 20, 15, 20 minutes of class to do her thing. Um, and I assisted. And this is a, I'm sorry, and this is a German 1003 class, third semester German meeting at 8 a.m. Monday through Friday in the basement of Falwell Hall. So at 8.35, I would open the door and Anu would walk in and then we switch to um, this study. Um, I believed that, the, that this instruction was valuable and so I was willing to allow this 15, 20 minutes every Monday in my class. Um, and so that was an important feature of it. The 15 or 20 minutes that we were together was um, an act, a co co mixture, a combination of some pre-teaching of some key vocabulary uh, participating in some spoken and one time a written activity, comparing students' responses with each other, and analyzing their own production by listening to recordings of themselves. We used a mixture of German and English uh, in all phases of the project. Across the semester, uh, we also worked at different discourse levels. And so at the beginning of the semester, we had activities where they really were describing an object. And so that was much more at the word level. So we taught them um, words to describe things, hard, soft, smooth, rough, um, straight, curved, um, at the top, on the bottom, on the side. Uh, and then a few more things like used to, um, connect, used to eat. So really eliciting, uh, eliciting just the, the, ob the name of the object. Um, later on, we moved to a sentence level where they had often a series of pictures or a, a picture that depicted, that had an, an action. And this elicited sentences because we had an an agent doing something, they, we had the verb that they were doing, the object, and often a prepositional phrase. And so there might be a picture that says, the old woman puts the key in the bag. And so that required students to not only describe, but, to, but describe the action and the location through the preposition. Finally, we complicated it even more in getting them to add sequencing which elicited more of a paragraph. Um, so they had to describe a process. And so in addition to the object, the action, they had to order it. Um, 
so initially, initially, nope, sorry, incorporating class topics. Initially, we, um, we were really focused on this idea of the strategy and, and what the vocabulary we would need. And so the first couple activities, really, that was our jumping off point. Um, but as we went through, we realized that we needed to, um, well, the first, the first activity really was, they, it was way too easy. And it was, they were describing a ball and a bat, and they ended up just referring to color. And so we knew right away we had to complicate it more. And we decided that we wanted to connect it more to class topics um, so that there was a little bit more of the vocabulary that would reinforce what we were already doing. Um, so there were a couple of, of ways. I'll, I mean, want to demonstrate the range of how connected it was or not. This first example was not very connected. Um, and it was assembling a lamp. So we had a nice picture of how to assemble an IKEA lamp and also how to assemble a Christmas tree stand. And these were great because the, the objects were such strange shapes and we had to do the ordering and you had to figure out how do you say, put it through the little hole and, and all things like that. So that was great. But at 8.35 on Monday morning, my students were kind of wondering, what are we doing? Um, and so at that point, I kind of think, oh, we got to try to nudge it more towards what we're doing the rest of, in the rest of the course. So another one we did then was during the chapter on uh, schooling and education, we talked about school supplies and objects in the classroom. And we had a table, and it was an info gap, and so they had to describe the object to their partner. Um, and, and they liked that in that it was very practical and somewhat connected to the, uh, to the course chapter. Um, but there was a, another level that was even better. And that was the third, um, the third type that was really much more directly related to the course content. And students in their follow-up interviews in particular commented on that those were more authentic, more useful, more practical. Um, and I'd like to describe those in a little bit more detail now. Um, this first one, it was a, a map activity. And this actually was the one, after, they, after the first week we recorded their voices and they all did it in about two seconds because they said, you know, it's blue, not black, and they were done. Uh, we, 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 then we really ramped it up. And, and this activity was the idea that one person um, is, you, their job is to be a courier on campus and deliver packages. And so they had their, their route that they follow to deliver packages, but they're sick. And so they're at home. And their substitute has the wrong map. Okay, an old map, a new map. And so through the use of the headphones in the language lab, they're simulating a cell phone conversation of trying to walk your partner through where you're going on campus. And the idea is that there are obstacles. There's construction sites. There are roads that are closed. And this proved very difficult, very difficult to students. Um, what I noticed, the reason we, I, we had kind of gone in this direction is because in that particular chapter we were working on prepositions and I had done a similar activity, not extensively, but in class working with a map of Berlin and, and so they kind of had done the same kind of thing. What I noticed um, is that I heard students using the prepositions that we'd been practicing and oh, I heard entlang mm -hmm. so many times and I was, that was fun. But, um, but they, they broke down in other vocabulary areas. Um, and this is one that we recorded, and Anu will talk about that in more detail a little bit later. Um, another one was buying a train ticket. And this one, this activity was different than all the others in that they watched a video with a voiceover 
So it was, a, it was a demonstration video. Some person in Berlin, in Germany, had made themselves. Not even commercial. Um, and so he's explaining how to buy a ticket using the machine. And so students watch that, listen to it, and then in a group, they had to write an email to a friend explaining how to use the machine to buy your ticket. Um, and so this was different in that we were bringing in writing, skill, presentational writing, um, which is a little bit different than the interpersonal speaking. But um, they, what was interesting here was the variety of ways they gave commands. And, and some of that came through the imperative form. Some of it came through use of modal verbs. Some of it came through simply by numbering. And that, that's the idea of how do, you how do you create this sense of ordering. They might not have known the words first, second, third, although we did teach that. Um, but, but they might have numbered it. And so it was, it was what was very interesting in, in the post discussion was the variety. And that was one of the things throughout the project that we were stressing is look at all the different ways you can accomplish this, this task. Um, so, and this was the activity that I think students found the most um, authentic and beneficial. It came also later in the semester after we had done the travel chapter. And so in a way it was a, a review for them. And I think that that was beneficial as well. The third um, one I want to describe is giving advice, the do's and don'ts of a job interview. And this was the final chapter of the semester. And it's a typical activity in a careers chapter is to do some kind of job interview. And so with this one, um, we said your, your task is to, you're applying for a job, you and your partner are putting together a list of do's and don'ts. You've brainstormed your ideas already. One of you has a list of before the interview, one of you has a list after the interview. And so they sat down hiding their sheets and this person had to describe these five behaviors to their partner. And so they had both images and some English text to work off of. And that proved also very interesting in terms of what, what students drawed on. Because they could, some of them I think were more visually oriented and would describe parts of the body that they saw, for example. Um, and, and others might pull linguistic parts from, from, the, from the language that they saw. So they, they draw it on different, different uh, resources. Similarly with the, with the train video, some of them focused on um, what they heard and trying to, to use that. Some of them tried to circumlocute and some of them made up new words. And so it was, again, a real mixture. Um, this was the final, vid the final audio recording of the semester, and Anu will have some more information about that later. For our data collection, um, my class had 14 students in it, and everybody um, did all of the in-class activities and recordings. But at the beginning, before we started, we selected four volunteers to be part of a pre and post group interview conducted by the researcher. And then we gathered their audio samples three times and the researcher analyzed those. Uh, the four participants, all are English speakers. Um, person B had extensive uh, French speaking background, including study abroad in the 1960s, at which time he also spent a little time in Germany. Um, otherwise, very short stays, just a week in the country. For in motivation, they were all motivated students. Um, 
with interest in learning German. Their proficiency levels, this student here had taken 1001 in the spring, 1002 in the summer, and was now in 1003. And, this, and language skills were much lower um, and proved more difficult. Um, yeah. Findings. All right, so once the data, uh, once we had the recordings and the data were collected, uh, we transcribed them and the first thing we looked for was the number of communication strategies the participants had used in the pre-instruction activity, which was the map task, and in the post-instruction activity, which was the interview task. Um, so the first thing we looked at was just the number and the graph here actually shows it the blue color represents the strategies in the pre-instruction and the red in the post-instruction activities. Do you notice something? <laughs> <laughs> it was really surprising to see that none of the participants had used any strategy in the pre-instruction activity. And this was not just one student, but there were four participants and not a single strategy. So I knew I was missing something or I hadn't noticed something, so I went back to the data <coughs> and noticed that they had used English words and phrases sometimes. So then I compared the number of English phrases or words they had used in, the, in both the activities and here's what I found. So in the pre-instruction activities, it wasn't that they were, it was not like they weren't using any strategy, they were just using one strategy which was code switching they just fell back into their first language and it was also a common language that everybody in the classroom understood. So whenever there was a difficult word or an unknown word, they just used the English word for it. I have some examples of how they used these English words here. Um, I'm going to read the English translation. Uh, that is an intersection. You can go over the rail track and then you must go through the hallway type thing intersection and hallway type thing being the English word or phrase. Um, um, not for Keller Hall, you want or uh, Washington Avenue is good and has no construction. The last one, yes, and then um, from Kolthoff Hall, you'll be at the sidewalk. Now what was interesting to notice all these instances where they use the English word or phrase was that if you notice where they used the German words, there was a lot of hedging, pausing, they took their time to think and frame the sentence in German. But when they used the English words or phrases, there was no hesitation at all. Now notice something here. In the second example, look at the German version. She starts by using English. She says, you want, and then switches immediately to German saying, Washington Avenue is gut. So what we believe happened there is whenever they, they are confident or they believe they can say something in German, they tried it out, but they, when they think they don't know how to say it or when they think they don't know the word for it in German, they give up. They just use the English word there. Now in contrast to this, I'm going to play some examples from the post-instruction activity you will see how they just don't give up. They might, there were again words or phrases they didn't know in German, but they just kept going at it, tried several communication strategies to try to communicate what they were trying to say. In the first excerpt, the phrase that the speaker is trying to say is, do practice the interview. This was the interview do's and don'ts of an interview task. Uh, the phrase she was trying, she's trying to explain here is do practice the interview and let's, um, Listen to it first. Oh, okay, thank you. The uh, conversation will be in German, but you have the English translations on the transcript. Mm -hmm. Du sollst auch vor dem Vorstellungsgespräch. Um, du sollst vielleicht in deinem Kopf machen. Du sollst über die, dem 
Vorstellungsgespräch denken? Ah, oh, uh, ich, ich, ich kann mag die, die Fragen für die... Ja. Okay. Oder maybe if you like with ein Freund oder ein ah, uh, Eltern. Ja, yeah, ja. Yeah. Uh, das ist, das ist uh, uh, ein, uh, uh, ein Vorstellungsgespräch uh, im Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, What's very interesting about this excerpt is that so the speaker starts explaining the phrase and once the listener guesses what she's trying to say, he jumps in with some of his own explanations or um, you know, paraphrasing the, fr uh, the phrase and trying to guess what she's trying to say. So interesting to see how both of them work together in making sure that the phrase is communicated well and understood correctly. In the second excerpt, uh, I would like you to pay attention to the number of strategies used and the variety in, um, in the strategies used. The word that, this, that the speaker has forgotten is Herr or Haare in German. He's forgotten it and you will see how he doesn't give up and uses strategy after strategy to try to recall it. Uh. Spielt nicht mit deiner äh, äh, welche Farbe hast du? Äh, ach, äh, auf den Kopf. Äh, welche Farbe hat die? Äh, 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 Uh, die uh, Brüne oder Grau oder uh, Rot. Uh, ach. Die Haare. Die Haare, danke, danke, danke. Uh, spielt mich uh, mit uh, deiner Haare. Oh. <lacht> So the speaker uses three strategies here. Here, um, the first one is very interesting and something that we've never come across until now. So he kind of lowers his voice and engages in self-talk, and he repeats the phrase, "What color is the? What color is the?" So we we spoke about this, and we believe that it's a memorized phrase or structure from his previous class, something that he might have learned in his beginner level class. And he's trying to recall the word by, by repeating that phrase. We do teach students these chunks, right? And it's probably a chunk that he learned. And it's, it's brilliant, actually. He's trying to remember the word by recalling that chunk. Uh, the second strategy he uses is appeal for help. He directly seeks the help of his partner and asks her, what grows on the head? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the last one is he gives examples of color, uh, like blue, blue hair, yeah, blue and gray, etc. But what's interesting is um, the, the listener helps him with the word and there's immediate uptake. He repeats it correctly saying, don't play with your hair. Right, so that's an impressive thing. Um, and the strategy used in the last excerpt that I'd like to play for you is dramatization. So uh, this, in this strategy, the speaker enacts a situation and plays a role in the situation. Okay? You can see that in, in the sentence it's given in quotes in your transcript. Und zuletzt, du musst dich verkaufen. So. Nicht verkaufen? Und du musst dich verkaufen. So. Du musst sagen, ich bin sehr gut vor Oh, Job. I, 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 I Calvin, uh, yourself. So as you can see from all these examples, the speakers exhibit a certain level of communicative resilience. That is when they don't know a certain word, 
um, they did not fall back to English, but they kept trying to um, explain the word by using several communication strategies. And that's something that we found throughout consistently in the data from the post-instruction activities. So summarizing our findings from the data and from our observations um, over the semester, the first thing we found was the use of their first language, English, versus the target language. And I should say this was something we didn't plan for. It was a totally unexpected outcome of the study. Communication, uh, teaching them communication strategies gave them the linguistic resources and more importantly, the confidence to speak in the target language. Earlier, they would, when they would just fall back to their first language, now they tried and took that effort to say the same thing in the target language. Second, we found that the more and more strategies they used, the more and more they stopped giving up trying something. The, they stopped avoiding saying an unknown word or abandoning what they were trying to say. In other words, they became more and more communicatively resilient. Their motivation and confidence increased over time. We will see this again in the next slide where students say the same thing and it was also corroborated by Dr. Kaut's observance, uh, observations in class. So there were certain students whose proficiency levels in speaking was very low at the beginning of the semester and increased significantly over the course of the semester and also especially around the times when we did act these activities with them. And as Dr. Kautz pointed out earlier, um, those activities that were very cognitively challenging to the students um, elicited more strategy use and it also really interested them more. So I conducted um, interviews with the participants towards the end of the semester to get their reaction and comments on the strategy instruction and here's what they said. So one of them said it was interesting to identify their own communication style to see how some of them um, preferred using certain strategies while the others preferred using others. The vocabulary sheet that Dr. Kautz and I actually put together and gave them, they said they found it really interesting. Now what happened with that is while we gave them the sheet initially, the student, we encouraged them to add to the sheet as the weeks went on. So it was something that we did together and they thought it was like a takeaway from the course. Uh, they, again, their confidence in speaking increased um, a lot. Now this comment was very interesting to me. So one of the participants said that this concentrated experience is what he called it in analyzing speaking was very helpful to him. So what we often do in language classroom is we get them to do speaking activities and then there's a product at the end of it through which we make sure that the conversation went correctly, like the info gap activities or, except, or something like that. But we very rarely come back to the conversation itself and make sure that that went correctly. So we did that a couple of times. We had them record their own conversations and we had them analyze their own conversations to identify their strengths and weaknesses and how they and the weaknesses can be overcome. So that's what the participant was referring to in this comment. And finally, the idea of moving away from perfection or that idea that there's only one way of communicating something. This was all that we focused on during the first two or three weeks. This idea that there are several ways of communicating something. It's not like conjugation rule where there's only one way to do this, but communication works differently. There are several ways of doing it. And if you don't know it, it doesn't mean you give up, but there are always other ways of doing it. So this is what, um, this, these were the comments of the students. Um, however, there were certain things to be considered as we looked at the data. So the first thing was timeline. So the pre-instruction activity was co collected at the beginning of the semester and the post-instruction towards the end of the semester. Now we all know students progress to a certain level on their own over the course of a semester. So that's something we need to bear in mind as we look at the data. Secondly, um, the individual proficiency levels of the students themselves and the activities themselves could have caused them to use the um, more communication strategies or more English words or less English words. And this could have caused the variance in the data also. These are things that we just had to bear in mind as we looked at them. Finally, I want to 
I want to talk a little bit about how one might go about using this uh, in the future if you wanted to implement this or if we were to do this again. Um, and I mentioned this at the beginning, putting it on the syllabus, building it in so that you've got that regular time block. And I think for me, thinking about myself, <laughs> really, no, I mean, I just, I knew at 8.35 on Monday, it was, we were gonna do 15 minutes of speaking and there was no way around it. You know, we weren't canceling it. Nothing else was going to impede that. And that, sticking to it, is a big thing. Um, this is something we would change. Um, often, the 15 minutes kind of got rushed at times. And so I think we would do it every other week so that we could really do the exercise and analyze it right then. Sometimes we waited for the following week to analyze it, and I would, I would prefer to do that together. Um, I mentioned this before, connecting it to the chapter themes. Um, the raising awareness was really important. Um, and this, is, I, I, this gets to that idea of we, we do it naturally in our L1, and doesn't it just transfer? But it, it was, it's amazing to do a couple of them in English to really demonstrate to them the variety that we're using in our L1. Um, including the activity, the practicing of it, and, but then also the analyzing. And, and I, what I really liked here was that the students listened for the strategies. They identified themselves and identified what worked and didn't work. And that's, that's one of the things when I've been listening to dialogues um, from my class this semester, I hear someone trying a strategy and the other person is not picking up on it, but the person did it three or four times, said the exact same thing three or four times, the other person didn't get it ever. You know, and then, so this, through this analysis, they learn, I gotta switch, I try something else, be resilient. Um, and so that's what this analysis by students can bring for you. And then we were talking about, you know, how do you, do you do this every semester? Do you start with the modeling? How much is repetitive? Don't students get tired of it? And so we're kind of thinking about with also in, in terms of any kind of strategy focus or teaching. And I, Anu was talking about it at the Goethe Institute. They have all these wonderful posters on the wall and before an activity you can say, and remember these are the phrases you need to use. Well, we don't have that here. We have our blank walls. And, and so one idea that I came up with that I would like to try out, which I haven't yet, but um, to kind of have like a generic slide before we do a speaking activity and just put it up there and, and remind them these are the, the strategies or these are the, the helpful vocabulary for this activity, which could also be done before listening activity or, or reading, just to, this idea of bringing, reminding them of the strategies they've already learned. Um, and we have five minutes for questions. <laughs> you, you skipped a slide with their comments at the end. Yeah, um, so I had some quotes from what they had said, actually three quotes. Should we go with them quickly? <laughs> okay. Um, Again, this was very interesting. So he says, look at the second line. He says, it's easy to talk about things in the abstract and to give your opinion, but when you get down to the concrete things, like how do you say, how do you do this together? What, are, what is this item? It's, it's really difficult. So he says, it's easy when you talk in the abstract, it gets difficult when it becomes more specific and you're know, talking about concrete things. And he said that these activities help them do that. Uh, yeah, so, and this participant spoke about how um, strategy instruction kind of helped her move away from using, again, just memorized structures and sentences, and how she was able to get creative with language use. And um, also, she had this confidence to build sentences on her feet. Um, and she, oh, this one was interesting, so she says, it, all the activities were really tough and challenging, but when you did it, 
you know, you really felt nice about them and it gave you the confidence to do it again. And I mean, if you listen to it, um, her voice kind of really goes up in the third sentence where she says, like, you could do it. And she's, she's really proud of herself when she says that. So I had these three. Well, we did it. <laughs> um, so I, you, you did activities. You had students do certain things. What, what did the kind of, um, what did the instruction look like? What, what did you, did you say today we're going to work on circumlocution and tell you what it is? Give you examples of it, give you an opportunity to do that. Or how, how did how did how did the instruction and instructional strategy communication strategies what did it look like? Um, so we did not focus on specific strategy like circumlocution. We didn't do that because um, we realized that they don't use just one strategy all the time. They use a combination of different strategies. So. Uh, um, like we said, so we just had activities for them that progressed, uh, that became more and more difficult over the course of time, over the course of the semester. But the explicit, the explicit part was, was with some specific vocabulary at the beginning, um, just words to describe which are words that we haven't used in the past. That was one thing. And then the ordering. We explicitly, so we, we, we taught explicit words and, and phrases, but then a lot of it was just them trying it out. But I think you also taught it inductively after the yes. test, right? Yes. So the instruction often came when they went back and they looked at what they had done, yeah. right? And at that point you might say, that circum you did circumlocution and you did something else. And what do you think of those different choices? And so the um, exactly, yeah. yeah. We would we would when we would gather the different types of responses they had and put that on the board, and then we would kind of compare and say, well, what what were you doing here? What was the strategy? Um, even though we didn't, and then Anu usually would give it the official strategy name. <laughs> but but we but it was more it was more point showing them what they had done helping them see what they had done. It's a lot of consciousness raising. Yeah, I was. It was like I said earlier. It was not that they weren't using. Some of them were already using these strategies naturally. So by in the analysis phase that always followed a certain activity, what we did was we pulled out these strategies they had used and pointed them out to them and said, "You can do this. So just use it every time you don't know a word." So that to me, to me a lot of this is switching from the one right answer. Um, sort of orientation to giving rewards to them for their creativity in using more than one way to say a thing. So it's like, what do we value in this classroom? Is it the one right answer? Sometimes. But also for this, it's, it's we're, we're going to reward, we're going to talk about, we're going to discuss how, what are the many different ways of saying a thing. It was really nice to see their switch from code switching to sticking to German. Very beautiful. I'm still a little bit confused. The analysis is what you did as a researcher, not what the students did themselves. There was actually both. So in the strategy instruction itself included um, involved them doing an activity and then analyzing what they did. So they, they analyzed what they did? Yes. So every week they kind of recorded um, sometimes they recorded their conversations and then listened to the recordings and just, you know, very informally looked at what, how they, what words they didn't know and how they still tried to communicate that. Um, that was the analysis the students did. What I did was just these three points during the course of the semester where, where I got the data from the students' recordings and kind of did like a more fine-grained analysis. So what was the task for the the instructions for the tasks that you gave to students when they re-listened to their recordings. Identify uh, the words or phrases that you found difficult to communicate. Did you just switch back to English? Did you abandon even communicating them? And if you did try to communicate them, how did you do it? And there were some who did it and some who didn't. So those who didn't learn from those who did. 
and I remember the, one, the first week after the math task, so the, the words like construction and sidewalk, none of them had used it. All of them had just used the English word. So the next week, we just completely dedicated to that. Now, in your groups, just think about how would you express the same thing with the German knowledge that you have. And they did come up with excellent answers. We just didn't think of it at that moment, the real time processing. I, I really love this one guy. He's obviously the older guy in Excel <laughs> 2. And I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I have seen people do this in their native language when they get a little older. <laughs> no, um, I think we, we do it. But I think there's this panic that sets in in a foreign language class because we're not aware that we do this in our native language and we try to hide it when we do. But the whole idea of bringing it out into the light and saying, this is normal, it's natural, and just because you can't think of the word in the foreign language doesn't mean that you panic and shut up and think you're a total failure, right? Because that, that is what happens if you, don't, if you don't do something like this in the class. Just, just a quick question about the methodology. This was all done in our computer classroom with the Dill. That's where we that's where we recorded students' voices for the purpose of analysis. Otherwise, it was done in the regular classroom. So they recorded themselves on their They own brought we school. had them pull out their smartphones mm -hmm. one day. Okay. And that, that example of the hair was because they couldn't they couldn't point to it. Right, they were in yes. the field. They were separate. So we consciously cut out just the use of gestures by doing that because then there were some phrases that could easily be uh, ex explained with the use of gestures like don't cross your arms, don't play with your head. It's very easy to do that with gestures. Thank you. As a German instructor, what textbook are you using that this is going along with? Oh, um, we have our own um, self-made materials. And, um, and this was only done in my section. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in German, we're thinking you know, on a lot of different lines about how we can increase strategy instruction. And so this kind of goes along with, with that. Have you thought of running a parallel section that doesn't have this instruction? I mean, well, we could do another. I mean, we could do another. I, I mean, my anecdotally, I know what's happening in my class this semester, um, but this class only had 14 students and the class now has 23. And that, I think off the bat makes a big difference. But, but I can tell, like that example I had with that one student used the same strategy three times and the other person didn't respond, didn't say anything. And there was just this, and I, and I kind of was thinking like, if we had been practicing this every Monday, that wouldn't have happened. They, the, the one student would have been more accustomed to coming to help, collaborate to come mm -hmm. to some kind of meaning, and the first student would have had more ideas of how to try to get her meaning across. But I think a controlled experimental setup would be a nice uh, yeah. master's thesis or <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because you mentioned it, it may have been natural, uh, just language development all mm -hmm. together without the influence of the instruction. That would mm -hmm. be useful, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. I suppose that's all. Yeah, that would be interesting to study. Thank you. Thank you.